our bodies are really remarkable. And they're remarkable for precisely the reason that normally we don't think about them at all. You know, when you think about how your body works, if you ever think about how your body works, I mean, my fingers fit on the end of my hand. My hand is at the end of my arm. I can move my hand, my fingers, without really thinking about that. And it's worthwhile considering how remarkable this really is, that, that all of this works fabulously well together until it doesn't. And when it doesn't, that's when we are, we have an injury or some disease or some problem. And then you realize that there's a fatal flaw in the design of our human bodies. You've probably noticed this already. You've probably noticed this already. Look at the person sitting next to you. What is the fatal flaw? Fatal is the wrong word there. What's the fundamental flaw in the design? I mean, if you, if you have a, cut your skin, you, know, you get a bump on the head, your body has this remarkable ability to regenerate, to heal itself, to come and, and, and fix things that, that are you know, really complicated and difficult. And yet, if I cut off my finger, it doesn't regrow. If, uh, if you have some severe infection, uh, uh, parts will wear out. Are you still looking at the person sitting next to you? <laughs> Where are the spare parts? I mean, if you were engineering some complicated system, you would have some spare parts around. So we want to try to address this. And when I was putting this talk together and I was thinking about this in terms of, of trying to fix a problem and listening to the talks here in this event uh, this morning, I realized that you know, that's a really limited viewpoint that we're going to fix this problem. The real reason that people work on these are the reason People do science. They don't want to solve the world's problems. They don't want to, want to make a million bucks. This is way too hard to do that. They do this because it's incredibly fun. I mean, if the police realized how much fun we were having when we're doing science, <laughs> don't tell them. So I'm going to talk about this in terms of solving a problem. I'll try to remind you that this is fun. I'm actually really happy that I came on right after Dr. Wagner, because what problem was he solving? You know, this is why people do things. It's not to fix something. You are not broken. Of course, consider this scenario. Um, let's take an elderly person. They might be a little bit obese, uh, might have diabetes. At some point, uh, it's not unlikely that they will have chest pain. Uh, usually that's the sign of a heart attack. What you do if you're elderly, obese, diabetic, and you have chest pain is they rush you to the emergency room where the wonderful ER doctors there will run a series of very complicated tests to try to figure out if you are having a heart attack, if you are getting a blockage in one of the arteries that feed your heart. And that's bad for you because your heart is a muscle and it needs to be beating. And the reason you have pain is because it's not getting what it needs. And so the doctors, well, they will if they figure out that you are having a heart attack, there are really two treatment options for you. The, if you're lucky, the less invasive one is called angioplasty, where they um, essentially insert a balloon into, your, uh, into the blood vessel and inflate it, which uh, uh, opens up the blood vessel, restores flow. 
But for about 100,000 people every year in the US, that procedure doesn't work. The doctors are able to figure this out. And they said, this won't work for this particular patient. For those patients, there's an alternative procedure called coronary artery bypass graft surgery. And that surgical procedure is not pretty. Um, what you do, what the doctors do in that case is they lay you on the table and they cut a hole in your chest. Uh, they break your ribs and they expose the beating heart. Now they need to do that because one of these arteries is blocked and they're gonna go take a blood vessel from your leg, open up your leg, take that blood vessel out and then patch that little piece of vessel, typically not very long, usually about that long, patch that around the, the damaged or the blocked artery and then close it all back up. And then you're really happy and you pay them lots of money. <laughs> now, this is rather invasive and so it's not unlikely that there are gonna be a number of complications from this type of surgery. And, uh, and, these, and some of the complications can be very severe. Uh, and so the American Heart Association keeps track of that. And it turns out that uh, probably about, of all the people that are re-hospitalized, about a third of them are re-hospitalized, not because of this hole that the doctor cut in your chest. They're re-hospitalized because of the problems with their leg. Um, some of you were paying attention and you will have noticed that I just said two different things. I started off saying that you don't have any spare parts and I just finished explaining how we use your body as spare parts, right? Except we don't because it's not a spare part. What is that blood vessel doing in there? Take a look. I mean, it's doing something, right? <laughs> and we can just go cut it out. This is generally a bad idea. And the only time it becomes a good idea is when the alternative is death. And so we're willing to accept these complications because of the severe consequences of not doing something. So what we would like to do in our lab is to come up with a way of creating, building, engineering a blood vessel that one could use for these patients. So to make a blood vessel, to make this artificial tissue, uh, we have this huge challenge, which is that you have an immune system. And immune systems are wonderful because they very carefully distinguish between you and everything else in the universe. So if I'm going to make something, a tissue, I don't want to put in a machine. We were talking about cyborgs this morning. We're not going to put in a machine. We're going to actually put in you. That means I need you. So those of you that have had a biology course at some point in your academic career know that you're made out of a bunch of cells. And so what I really need is I need a bunch of cells. And it turns out the type of cell that I need is a stem cell. And fortunately, you are full of stem cells. Now the stem cells in you are actually rather rare. One in a million or so roughly of your cells are stem cells. Um, but if I had some stem cells, I could isolate them, differentiate them into the tissue that I wanted, uh, grow it up in a laboratory and put it back in you. So the question is, are you still looking at the person sitting next to you? <laughs> Do you see the stem cells? And before, uh, well, you can't really see them because you're covered up with skin. But um, there are stem cells in there. So the question is, uh, where is the excess tissue where I'm going to get the stem cells from? Where do you carry your excess tissue? That's where I carry mine. So it turns out that uh, Two or three tablespoons of fat tissue have several million stem cells in them. And we can isolate those stem cells from the patient and we can grow them in the laboratory 
and differentiate them. Uh, it is, I wouldn't say it's trivial, uh, it's not hard to do. In fact, uh, we are doing it right now today in my laboratory. We, are, uh, they, we isolated the stem cells yesterday uh, from a, a, I wouldn't call it a patient, it was more like a pig, but it's the same <laughs> idea, okay. Um, so, but we're isolating these, we're going to, now, you know, we need, a, we need a little bit more than cells, so to make this tissue, we, we need, have you ever, you ever wake up at three in the morning and wonder what you should worry about? <laughs> what, I, what I worry about is why am I not a puddle of cells lying in the bed? You're made up of cells, right? Why are they, what, what makes them stick together? Well, it turns out you've got a bunch of tissue glue that holds them all together. In fact, you even know what the tissue glue is. The most common tissue glue is collagen, but there are lots of other important ones. We use, in our laboratory, we use a flat sheet, not of collagen, but of a collagen-rich material. It's a membrane, very thin. We take the stem cells and we seed them onto this flat sheet. Then we take that sheet, so this sheet is about that big, we take that sheet after the cells have about a day or so to sit down and stick on this. We take what is essentially a pencil. It's a little bit more expensive than a pencil, but basically think of it like a pencil and a piece of paper. And then you roll this sheet up six or seven times. And then you pull the pencil out and what you have left is a tube. And we need one more thing to make a tissue and that's the right environment. And the right environment is going to be provided by a thing we call a bioreactor, which causes flow to go through this. It gives the right food, the right temperature, all of the f things that this cell needs. We have the bioreactor. We put the rolled tissue construct in that. And over a period of somewhere between two to six weeks, these bunch of cells and this collagen material turns into a blood vessel. And if it works, one would take a patient that comes into a hospital, take some stem cells, doing a liposuction, build this tissue, and then re-implant their own tissue back in them without doing this second surgery. And this is, I think, the idea, why do we do this? Because we're solving problems? Yeah, maybe. But I do this because it's great fun. And I wish you guys, especially the young people here, uh, go out and do the thing that's the most fun. It's definitely, definitely rewarding. Thank you very much.